We gladly welcome you all who have made the great sacrifice in being here. We know how difficult it is to, for many of you to work all day and then get the kids ready and there's a lot to do in the course of a day and never enough time to do it. So we really value your presence here tonight. And uh, before we open up the scriptures, we'll just take a moment to look to God for help and his blessing upon his word. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we draw near tonight, uh, giving thanks for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have been reminded repeatedly in song of the simplicity of salvation, the wonderful truth that Jesus died for me. It is all that we have, it is all that we need, and pray that many tonight who are yet out of Christ without a Savior might avail themselves of a Savior who is longing to reach and save their precious souls. So, Father, we look heavenward tonight for help from above as we would open up the scriptures together that we might magnify the person of Christ and speak of him as the Savior of sinners. So we commit ourselves in this meeting into your care and look to thee for help and blessing as we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Yesterday, I greatly enjoyed telling how God in his mercy saved my soul how I came to Christ, and it is my exercise to continue on that theme throughout the week in the will of the Lord, and do remember the meetings as have been announced Monday through Friday at 7.30 p.m. And in, in coming to Christ, uh, it's a very humbling thing, but uh, there's one thing I'd like to add to that tonight. Uh, as you recall, I, I said the Lord saved me at about 5 minutes to 11 in the morning on a Thursday morning. Instead of going to school, I stayed home and asked God to save me, and he did. Well, I remember that night, my family was getting ready for gospel meeting to go to the hall, and I wasn't getting ready. My mother came to me, I was sharing this with Paul just before the meeting. My mom said, why aren't you getting ready for meeting? You just got saved this morning. I said, well, I'm saved. I don't have to go to meeting. That's for people who aren't saved. And her in her, in her wisdom, saved all of maybe six months, said, uh, Donald, you get ready and you go to meeting tonight and you will hear the gospel tonight like you never heard it before. Wow, was she right. And uh, I hope there's a young woman here tonight uh, who will hear the gospel like never before. So. Read together first in Luke's gospel, chapter 5. And if you will allow me, I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. And I had forgotten to do this, so bear with me. We're going to read uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, about a man who was declared unclean because of his leprous condition. Luke 5 and 12 says, While he, the Lord Jesus, was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show, show yourself to the, the Jewish priests and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he withdrew, he would withdraw to a desolate, he with, he, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And then finally to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64. About in the middle of our Bibles, written about seven centuries before the Lord Jesus came into the world, before his birth, often referred to as the Gospel of the Old Testament. It was certainly influential in my salvation, but we're going to read in Isaiah chapter 64, and just reading together at verse 6 
And in consideration that we read of one man who was unclean because of his leprosy, we read in verse 6, that, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities or our sins, like the wind, have taken us away. We trust the Lord will be pleased to add his blessing to that which we have read and that will be, which will be spoken. To come to a meeting takes sacrifice. To come to Christ can be done right in the seat where you're sitting. It doesn't require any physical activity whatsoever. Repenting and believing is done in one's mind. We notice when the Lord performed miracles, there is almost always, if not always, the same word mentioned over and over in every miracle. And it's the word immediately, immediately. When the Lord cleansed the leper, the change was immediate. When the Lord gave sight to blind people, it was immediate. When he spoke to the winds and the waves and there was a great calm, it was immediate, instantaneous. And what a wonderful illustration that when God saves a sinner, it is immediate and it is oh so simple. It can be done with no physical effort and in this very seat where you are sitting tonight. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. God wants you to come to Christ for salvation. And notice the, just the, the acronym, the, the words, the letter in the words come, C-O-M-E. Who does God want to come? Sometimes we use those letters. C, children. God loves it when children come to Christ. That's what he, he said when the Lord Jesus was here on earth. The disciples themselves were trying to keep the kids away from the Lord. No, let them come to me. Lord loves children, and he wants children to be saved. And then the letter O, he wants older people to come too. Older people are welcome to come to Christ. It's never too late. doesn't matter what age you are or M, middle-aged people. I'm not middle-aged unless I live to be 116, but the Lord welcomes middle-aged people as well. And E, everybody. Everybody can come to Christ. You know, sometimes you go to places, and I don't like amusement parks anymore. I don't find them very amusing. But, uh, you know, I remember a long time ago when I was, you know, this tall, and you'd get up to that measuring line, and you had to be this tall to get onto that crazy spinning ride that I would never go on again. But I couldn't wait to get tall enough so I could go on that ride. It just, I just wasn't tall enough. I don't have a problem with that anymore, but... I don't want to go on that ride. You had to be a certain height, or sometimes you, you go somewhere and you have to be a certain age, and there are restrictions, but not when it comes to coming to Christ for salvation. Anybody can come, whosoever can come to Christ. No limitations, no restrictions. Doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Doesn't matter what age group you may fall in. Nobody is so bad that they can't come to Christ. And nobody is so good that they don't need to come to Christ. I think Isaiah chapter 64 made that crystal clear. It's not only lepers who are unclean. The prophet Isaiah says that we are all as an unclean thing in the sight of a holy God. What makes us unclean? It's not something physical and external and something just comes to my mind and I had no intention of mentioning this but I don't know how old I was and I, I wasn't raised hearing the gospel obviously but I want to guess I was maybe 10 or 11 years old and perhaps I was listening to people who I went to school with and uh, apparently I developed was developing a, a foul mouth and my parents didn't like it at all and I actually remember my mom taking an bar of ivory soap, which is, if I, if I remember correctly, 99 and 44 one hundredths pure, and 
she literally rubbed it onto my teeth and in my mouth. And uh, it was disgusting because I still remember it. I'm trying to get soap out of your teeth. I understand her intention. She said I had a dirty mouth and she was trying to make it clean. Well, it might have made my teeth cleaner. Uh, and I certainly was careful at what I spoke in front of my parents, but the problem wasn't my mouth, it was my heart. It's what comes out of a mouth that reveals what's within. The problem was my heart was filled with sin. I was unclean before God. And you know, maybe you're much more well-behaved in your youth than I was. Maybe you don't say those words that I did. I hope, I hope you're more well-behaved than I was. I really do. But our hearts are the same. Hearts are the same. You see, man looks on the outward appearance, and my mom was just looking on the outside, what she was seeing, what she was hearing, and her attentions were, were great, but didn't really fix the problem. Not until I came to Christ. And when you come to Christ, you know what happens? It changes you on the inside first. The religion that I was raised in, it attempted to change me on the outside. And to some extent it may have, but it didn't penetrate. It didn't really get to the root of the problem. It just dealt with the symptoms and failed at that. The problem was my heart, that it was unclean because of my sin. And with all the love that we have for your soul tonight, we want to be faithful in declaring what God's word says about you and me and each one of us, that we are all unclean before God because of our sin. And we all need God's salvation. You notice how many times we read of that word in that little verse in Isaiah, all, all, all. We're all unclean. We all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, our sins, have separated us from God. There's another portion, and I believe it's in Isaiah. He identifies the very source of the problem. You know, oftentimes you, you catch a cold. Amazing thing, there's no cure for a common cold. So we treat the symptoms. That's the best we can do. But that's not enough when it comes to taking care of the problem or our sin. It's not enough to treat the symptoms. You've got to get right to the source, right to the source. And that's exactly what Isaiah points out. He says, you know what the problem is? He says, your sins have separated you from God. Your sins, your sins, your sins are the problem. Your sins are what makes you and what has made me unclean before God. God is only identifying the problem so that you might do something about it. You know, it's sad that when we have symptoms in our body and we just try to ignore them, and I think as I get older, I'm doing the same thing my, my parents doing are doing and my in-laws are doing, as, you know, just ignoring the symptoms and hoping they go away on their own, you know, it's been three months and... Look at the symptoms. They're revealing a problem that's inside. It's right in our hearts, right in our hearts. We are all as an unclean thing. So we know who, who can be saved. The children, the older ones, middle-aged, everyone can be saved. When should we be saved? I have a stepbrother in Pennsylvania. He was four years old. His parents kind of doubted when he made a confession of faith in Christ, and they wouldn't doubt it now. Four years old, not too young. You could be 100 years old, not too old. Anybody can come to Christ, whosoever. It's a wonderful word, isn't it? I love it when parents give their children scriptural names right from the Bible, you know? And I like to say, mine's in the Bible. Donald's in the Bible? John 3, 16, look in the middle. Whosoever. I can remember Jean saying, put your name there. Put your name there. So my name is there. I'm whosoever. Whosoever will, whoever's willing, may come. And so we have in this portion that we read of a, a man who is unclean because of leprosy, 
And I would have done in that day what every other person was doing. I would have stayed clear of that man. He must have lived a tremendously isolated life. And I look back on COVID, and I had it three times, and I remember the worst part of COVID was not how I felt. It was the isolation. It was the isolation. Especially the first time I had it. It was really early. Still went to work, and pretty much everybody had it. And you just went home, and you kind of locked yourself in a room for a week. <laughs> Horrible. Symptoms I didn't mind. And I'm sorry if you had symptoms far worse, and I know people who did, and I know somebody who died from it. But for me, it was the isolation that was the worst. Away from family. That's what this man's life was like. Not for a week, but who knows how long it may have been. This man had leprosy and everybody knew it. And he had to make sure that everybody he approached knew it. He had to announce it. I'm unclean. And here, for some reason, this man is coming to Christ. He's coming to Christ. I wonder what he knew. I wonder if he considered, would the Lord receive him as he was in his unclean state? Or would he too send him away? And this man comes, and he knows all about his condition. He couldn't hide it. Everybody knew about it. Here comes the man who's unclean, and they, they, they were right to do what they did and stay away from him so that they wouldn't catch it and spread it to others. It was absolutely right to do that. This man was ceremonially unclean and lived an isolated life. I love his confession as he comes to the Lord with tremendous faith. And he says this to the Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Imagine that. If you want to, you can make me clean. Is there somebody in the audience tonight or watching from home? And you realize that you're unclean because of your sin. Are you saying that to the Lord tonight? Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. There's nobody else to turn to. This man didn't go to the disciples. He didn't go to his parents. He didn't go to a preacher. He went to the right place. He went to the right person. He said the right thing. Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. That's tremendous faith. I wonder if he witnessed other miracles from afar. I don't know. Amazing faith. Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Notice the cure. What does the Lord say in response? He says, if you want to, and the Lord says, I want to. I'm willing. Be clean. Be clean. But you notice before the Lord says that, he does something that probably this lever, leper never expected. In his isolation, I imagine it's been a long time since somebody just stretched out their hand like the Lord did and touched them. Something about the human touch that just expresses our love, our compassion for another individual. And the Lord does something that I imagine was totally unexpected, and he reaches out his hand to the leper and he touches him. I'm willing. Be clean. It's remarkable that the Lord, as he demonstrated many times beforehand, doing miracles just by speaking. He spoke to the winds and to the waves. But to the leper, while he could have just said, be clean, I'm willing, be clean. <laughs> but he said, no, be clean. What compassion. What compassion, what it must have meant to that man just to have the Lord touch him and hear those words. I'm willing. 
speaking. What's the change that we see in this man? It happens immediately. The change is instantaneous. He was no longer clean, unclean. He's now cleansed from that leprosy. It's gone. Look at my skin. It's like a newborn child. I've got our seventh grandchild coming in March, Lord willing, and is nothing like the skin of a newborn child. It's just like so pure and hasn't been exposed to the sun like my leathery face and just so soft. I imagine that's what it was like for that man. Now, what a change. What a change. It was an outward change that was evident to all. And you know, when God gets a hold of a sinner and they come as they are in all their uncleanness because of their sin, and they cry out to God, Lord, make me clean. He doesn't wait. He doesn't make you go through a process. He responds immediately. Let me replace that word, if I may, instead of saying clean. Lord, save me. You ever cried that out to God? I'm unclean. Lord, I want to be saved from my sin. The moment I cried that out, he saved me. Didn't make me wait in my misery a moment more than was necessary. Immediately, as I stated last night, I was in tears in my bedside, wanting to be saved. And I, it wasn't until I asked God to save me, he did immediately. And I just remember, I couldn't see it, but I know there was a big smile on my face. I'm saved. I'm clean. I'll never be in hell. I'll never perish in my sin. I'm saved and I'm saved forever. It was a change in this man's life and a change internally. Oh, I can imagine the love he had for Christ at that moment and appreciation of what he had just done for him. Just by the power of his spoken words. How much more we appreciate our Savior because he loved me and he gave himself for me, that he died on the cross for me. And as we sang repeatedly, Donald, why are you going to be in heaven? Four words. That's all I need. Four words. Jesus died for me. Not... Here's a list of things that I've accomplished in my life. Not that I, I'm a good person and... No. Jesus died for me. That's all I have. I am resting my eternal well-being on four words. And every believer is doing the same. Jesus died for me. That's what I understood. That's how God saved me. Four simple words. What a wonderfully simple and yet profound truth. Jesus died for me. Can you say that? Children, older ones, middle age, everybody, whosoever. The change was immediately immediate in that man's life. The Lord stretched out his hand and touched that man. In closing, I just want to draw your mind to this. It would be a little while later that again the Lord Jesus would stretch out his hands upon a cross to show mankind the love of God. There were two things at least on display when the Lord Jesus died on Calvary. God's great love for mankind and man's hatred toward God, both on full display. When my children were little, my baby's almost 30, wow. When my children were little, we'd read together at nighttime, read them a story, sometimes act it out. And then they would say, Daddy, Show us how much you love us. And I would just stretch out 
my arms as far as I could. That's how much I love you. I want you to I want to do what the Holy Spirit desires to do tonight for you to point you to Christ. And if you can imagine him there long ago hanging upon a cross with nails in his hands and his feet with his arms outstretched showing the world just how much he loves you. He was willing to die for you. He was willing to shed his life's blood for you so that you can say, Jesus died for me, so that you could be made clean from all your sin, so that you can spend eternity in the presence of a holy God without fear, but looking with great anticipation that someday I'm going to be in the presence of God, my Savior, and I'm going to bow down before him and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm not looking forward to dying, but I'm looking forward to what's afterward, to spending eternity with my Lord and my Savior. And thank him forever. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I was 16 years old when the Lord saved me. And some of you here are much younger than that. You can be saved. Don't wait till you're older. Come now. Come tonight. Not to me. Come to Christ. Right where you're sitting. As you will continue to hear the gospel. And as we seek to speak highly of the Lord Jesus. And the power. The ability that he has demonstrated. In taking a person who was unclean because of his leprosy. And making him clean in a moment of time. And what he did physically for that man. He is able to do for anyone spiritually. Is made unclean because of their sin. And in a moment of time, he is willing. He's ready. He's willing. He's able to save you, to make you clean from your sin. And I trust that by faith that you might come to Christ and say with the rest of the believers here tonight, Jesus died for me. Good evening. If you could turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, if you're not still there, just a couple chapters away from where Mr. Labby was speaking, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord really poured out or caused the son of this passage to feel the judgment for us all, is what the verse is saying. Turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Just for the remainder of the meeting. Last night I was enjoying Don's story and thinking about a word from the Lord. Jonah got a word from the Lord. The book of Jonah starts off with those words. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
And that wasn't the word of the Lord. Verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried, every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. The shipmaster called upon him and said, why are you sleeping? They tried to figure out who was responsible for the storm, <clears throat> found out it was Jonah. Verse 10, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, verse 11, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous, very violent. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. But they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. I would just say now, they were given a word from the prophet, but they didn't listen to it. They tried again, hard, rowing hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord. They prayed, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Or we might say they feared the Lord exceedingly. They, they admired the Lord exceedingly. They sacrificed to him thankfully. And they committed, they made vows, they committed to him voluntarily. There was a great change in those men. Before we talk about this, I just have a few questions that really impressed me. Who's, who do you think God cares more for in this story? We read about a wicked city. We read about a wayward prophet of the Lord. And then we read about these worshipers. It says they, they called out to their own gods in the beginning. They were idolaters, worshipers, misdirected worship. Who do you think the Lord cares more about? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, but of great concern was this cry of wickedness that was coming out from a great city. And then, as it seems to us, it just happens to be that Jonah goes down to Joppa and he gets in a boat with some fishermen. Does, care, does God care about those fishermen? Who do you think the Lord cares more about in this story? Whose sin do you think is greater? Certainly the sin of a great city. That must be a great cry. It says... Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The wickedness of a great city crying up to God. It must have been deafening to his holy ears. But when his one servant disobeys him, we heard the word immediately. Immediately. God is following this man down to Joppa, down into the bottom of a boat, down across the sea. And in fact, God takes a great storm like you and I, like the men were casting things out of the ship, like Jonah would cast his money onto the plank. This is my fare. This is my pay. Like men were casting lots. All these things are cast. God just picks up some wind and he throws it onto the ocean. Why? Because of a great city? No, because of one man running from him. But what about these sailors 
idolaters. God's aware of what's happening. And in fact, Jonah says, and the men are concerned. What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? They all of a sudden realize there's a great storm. And we read that the, they thought the storm was going to break the ship. They realize God is, is speaking to his prophet, but they're caught up in this judgment. Jonah says, Take me and cast me forth into the sea so that the sea may be calm unto you. Who sins greater? The sin of a great city? The sin of a wayward prophet? Or the sin of sailors who have been worshiping idols for who knows how long? One other question. Whose cry, whose prayer do you think God cared more for? Whose prayer? We didn't read about two of them. We didn't read about Jonah's prayer. That's going to come in the next chapter. We didn't read about the prayer of the city. That's going to come in the last chapter. We read these words. Verse 14, wherefore they cried unto the Lord. We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish. For this man's life lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Whose prayer do you think God cared more about out of the three great Prayers that came up, a prayer of a great city. Must have been something. It's a story for another night, perhaps. A whole city bowed down, realizing their sin is offensive to God. Their sin has gone up into the presence of God. God hears their wickedness. Like you or I would just listen to kids playing in the street. Jonah. His prayer is something else. From the, the belly of a whale or a fish, fathoms down in probably the Mediterranean Sea. And God hears his cry. God hears his prayer. But this is the prayer of the one that we read tonight. Who's is more important to God? Who does God care more about? must have been something for these men, these mariners, these sailors. They see this prophet, they maybe, maybe didn't know who he was, come down onto their boat, pay the money, and maybe it was just a normal day for them, just another day. They had their tackling for the ship. They had the things that they were probably sailing from one end to the other. It doesn't sound like they were fishermen. It sounds like more like they were merchantmen carrying things from one port to another port. They we're going to be heading to Tarshish. He found a ship going to Tarshish all the way across. They were, they were here, if you're looking at the map, and they were going to sail all the way across the Mediterranean, underneath Italy, all the way across to where Spain comes down. Long trip, I imagine. They had plans. They've done this before, probably. However many were, we don't know how many it was. All along their travels, they probably had their own idea of who made the world, where the world came from. There's all sorts of gods that were worshipped all along the Mediterranean coast. We don't know the nationalities of these men. We don't know the languages they spoke. But they were able to communicate with Jonah. So they at least shared a language. Maybe it was a language of commerce. But they were men who had an impression of God and they had their idols. And when time came tough, when the storm hit them, they prayed every man to his God, verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his gods. And all of a sudden, the wares, the things that they were hired or that they were hoping to trade or sell or carry for somebody else, they're gone. Things of this world, things of value for business, for money, 
They're gone. This is a storm that's going to break our ship. This is going to storm that, that's going to affect our lives. But they prayed to their gods. Their gods apparently didn't do much for them because they're trying other things. And they're trying to find out why has this come upon us? Concerned. They find out, and it's a shame people go through life and problems come and they realize very quickly, you know, what, I, what my security was in, what my schedule was filled with. Even young children, what was important to me at one point, all of a sudden I'm afraid and I realize these things aren't, aren't important to me. We have this chart behind us. Very important concepts are represented on that chart. Life. Death, heaven, hell, eternity, your soul. These men all of a sudden very quickly realized what was important. And it wasn't our boat. It wasn't our schedule. It wasn't the things that we were carrying. It wasn't the things that seemed so important to us. I said, wait a minute, there's, there's a man sleeping. Let me go see. The captain goes down and says, you need to wake up and call upon your God. I'm sure it was remarkable. Here is pagan idolaters, and they're asking, they're having to ask a prophet, a preacher, would you pray, please? And the preacher having to be reminded by idolaters, people who didn't know the one true God. Oh, they're asking me to pray. I got to wake up and pray. But he gets up. But the concern of the men was, they were, the men were exceedingly afraid. Why have you done this? The men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord in verse 10. What shall we do unto thee that the sea may become calm for us? Calm for us. This storm must have been something. A great storm that God threw. And the sea and the waves. Just maybe some of you have been on boats before. Many years ago, my father and I went out with some of his friends and their kids, and we were out trying to fish, and I thought, I remember walking up in this great big boat, it's a huge boat, big steel, multi-level, and we went out early in the morning, and it just kept going in the same direction, and land was getting further and further and further and further, and then until it disappeared. It's like, wow, this big boat, and you look around, you think you're so small, and then the waves started, and the swells, and what seemed like such a big boat, next thing you know, you're, you're looking way down, and then as the swell would come up, you're looking up at water 20 feet above your head. And then somehow it would change down. And then the waves got higher and sharper. And the bows of the water started crashing over the bow of this boat. And not in a very long time, we realized this big boat, I think it was 75 feet long, was just like a cork bobby. And the waves, there was no question. Where was the power that day? It wasn't in this boat. It was in the water. Smashing and breaking upon the bow of this boat. The mariners understood a great power, a great storm. They'd crossed other times probably, but this was a great storm. And they were afraid. You think God was concerned about them? Absolutely, he was. You know what they were concerned about? Their life. Their life coming to an end. Because then they were going to go out into eternity. God sends them a message. They said, what shall we do? 
And he said, Jonah, the prophet, said to them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so that the sea shall be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. You know, they had no reason to doubt this man. The fact that he was running from God, if anything, that let them know that his God was real, like he's, he's trying to get away from his God. There was no reason to doubt this man's relationship with God. There was no reason to doubt the God of Jonah. In fact, they didn't doubt him. But they were being just as disobedient as Jonah. Jonah was told, go to Nineveh, and he didn't go. These men, nevertheless, verse 13, the men rode hard to bring it to land. They were already told they got a word from God. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Why do people, young or old, go so far, so long in life, down that broad road, trying to get to a destination that they're never going to reach on their own? Why do we go so long down a road looking for peace that's never going to be found on a road? The road of life without Christ. Why do people work so hard to ease guilt of things that we did when we were a child, when we're never going to find forgiveness or the ease of guilt on that road? The things that we do at the ages of some of you, they, they, they follow you. They, they, you never get rid of them. You realize Mr. Labby was talking about a foul mouth, an unclean mouth, things that he said. He still remembers them at his middle age age that he is right now. How come he doesn't forget? Because he remembers. He remembers what he did. How come I remember? I remember what I did. It matters what we do. And not just to us, to a God who's watching, who's following us, who's following his, his servant, Jonah, as he's hearing the cries of a great city at the same time while he's watching these mariners that he has followed their whole lives all their lives they've been they've been oblivious to him they've even gone after other gods and now they're not listening to his own word don't go don't go long don't go any further than tonight we've already heard the gospel why would you want to go another day trying to make it on your own, trying to go on your own. I know we've heard the gospel before. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. Finally, something clicked. And what they do? They did exactly the word that the prophet of God gave to them. They picked up Jonah as hard as it was, and they threw him over the edge of the ship and he disappeared and the sea was calm it says there was a great calm the sea ceased from her raging i don't think they saw a ripple i don't think they saw the ship i mean the the, the fish i don't think they saw jonah anymore but what we do know is the sea ceased from her raging and it was for them because jonah said Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so the sea shall be calm unto you. Calm unto you. They understood this calm was for us. That man went under the waves. That man went into the sea. That man has faced certain judgment from God so that we might face this great calm. No wonder the men feared the Lord. They're not idolaters now. Whatever was left in their, of their gods that they were worshiping, they probably, who knows what they did with it. They feared God exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice out of thanksgiving, thankfully, and they committed unto the Lord. They made vows. They made promises to the Lord voluntarily. God didn't tell them to do that. This was a great change. But why did they go so long? Why did they try? Why did Jonah leave the Lord when... Try to lead the presence of the Lord. Why is the wickedness of Nineveh rising up? Well, we read it all in Isaiah. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. Don't look at a great city of, it's like, oh, how, how wicked was the wickedness of wicked Nineveh. And how could Jonah try to run from God? Why would he do that? And these mariners, why were they idolaters? And why would they not listen to the word of God that they were given the first time? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And it's like we're rowing and we're trying and we're going down that broad road, trying everything but the word of the Lord that God has given. And what's the word of the Lord? The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. There was a great storm that came out that day that the mariners hadn't faced before. Well, I can tell you there was a great storm that crashed down on the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary where we heard. It's never been seen, never been felt, will never be felt again by anyone. A great storm of judgment when the Lord God laid on his son the judgment for sin. And there was no calm for the Lord. There was, no, there was no going under it. He endured it all until the storm was exhausted. And he said, it's finished. And the judgment and the payment for sin was done. And for you and I, there's a great calm. There's great forgiveness. There's great peace. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop rowing, try, trying to do it on your own. Just listen to the words of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the gospel from Isaiah as we heard. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you for listening. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for these stories of a, a leper who could turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and really uh, uh, a vessel full of men who could also individually turn to God and find a relationship and find blessing. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, for what he has done at Calvary. Again, we are reminded of him and that great work and the great offer being presented tonight through thy word, through the gospel. Bless young and old here, here personally and for all those online. We look to thee, our God, Thankful for the night, thankful for the Lord Jesus, thankful that he can save, in whose name we pray, amen.